Welcome to the Defence Forces podcast brought to you by the Defence Forces Public Relations Branch. Hello and welcome to the Irish Defence Forces podcast. My name is Captain Keen Clancy and today we welcome onto the show Airman Tyg Weddick, a winchman serving in 302 Squadron in the Irish Air Corps. Tyg is going to talk to us about the roles and responsibilities of being a helicopter crewman in the Irish Air Corps. Welcome on, Tyg. Thanks very much for, for being with us today. No problem at all. Thank you. Um, and th- I know you're currently on a POTS course, so thanks very much for... No worries, <laughs> it's yeah. a It's a different, definite change of pace, I imagine. Definitely, yeah. So I'd usually start the podcast by just kind of getting you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about yourself. So um, how did you come to join the Irish Air Corps? Where are you from? What's your what's your story? Yeah, so yeah, so I grew up in Camainham in Dublin 8. Um, as a kid, I always had an interest in the Army from a very young age. Um, so once I turned to the, the right age to join... I looked into joining and um, I actually joined the reserves first, the Reserve Defence Forces, the 62nd Cavalry Squadron, as it's formerly known as, now the 2CAV Reserve. So I um, joined up there in 2008. I did about three or four years there, did um, a good few courses there, um, a lot of operations, made some good friends, and um, that just confirmed my decision to join the Defence Forces. So after a few years there, I joined the PDF. Um, and at the time, I did my training in, in the Air Corps in Baldonnell. So it was 20, 2011, joined the Air Corps um, into the 14th for Cooper Toon. So, in the, yeah, went full time then. Um, that training was about six or seven months long. And um, that is how I got into the Air Corps, essentially. So, okay, so talk to us briefly. Like, so you've joined the Air Corps, Tig, and like, you know, you're kind of looking around Baldonnell here and seeing the various things that are being done. And what, what made you make a decision to become a crewman for a, for a helicopter? What, what attracted you to that job? Yeah, so... When I joined, yeah, I seen helicopters everywhere, obviously, flying around Baldonnell. Um, had an interest in it already, in, in aviation, so I did a bit of research on that and um, the roles uh, that, that we're going to talk about, what, what helis do, and that just, yeah, that I got really interested in that. So um, before we passed out, um, you have a, a preference of what unit you'd like to join. So number one was, was helis, number three, Operation Squadron. Um, I didn't get it, I didn't get it, so I got number one. Um, Operation Squadron, which is the, all the fixed wing, the planes. So I actually went in there first for a year or so, um, which is great as well. Um, I was essentially waiting for the the air crew course to come up, which yeah. came up in about 2014. Um, so I applied for that. Um, and yeah, so I applied for that, got that. So then I went on to the selection course. So to become an air crew, you have to go through the selection course tests. There's a lot, there's a lot of tests. Um, there's the fitness test, so your standard army fitness test. Um, we throw in pull-ups as well, so there's the pull-up test as well. You have to try to get a maximum number of them in a certain time limit. You have a, an interview as well, which is fairly, uh, it's a very tough one as well. Like you know, it's, it's a competition at the end of the day. You're competing with people from all over the army. Um, you have your interview, some more kind of fitness stuff. Um, it's also you have to be a competent swimmer. So that was a big thing, and it is a big thing for a lot of people. To be a crewman, you have to be a very confident swimmer. So. You're brought down to the Defence Forces Training School into the pool there and you're put through a number of uh, tests in the pool. Okay. Um, a lot of confidence tests and stuff like that. Like, and Another one of the tests is um, a confidence test is a bridge jump in Blessington. So you have to jump off that bridge twice, which is a pretty pretty big height. Yeah. And it can be pretty uh, nerve-wracking for some people, um, myself included. Um, you have to do that. Then also there's another test we have. Again, just to prove and to show you're confident that you're a confident swimmer is um, you have to swim under one of the aircraft, so we'll have one of our helis come in um, and it goes into a low hover over the water and you have to swim through that, that hover, um, which is pretty intense. Yeah. The aircraft are approximately like seven tons. So you have that much downwash coming on top of you and you're in the water, cold water. My, te- my, my test was actually in the middle of February, so wow. <laughs> very, very cold. Um, but yeah, that's, there's a lot of tests there. I don't think there's a lot of people in, in, in the Defence Forces at large wouldn't realise that there's such water confidence element to selection for a crewman. Yeah, again, you don't have to be Michael Phelps, you know, you yeah. just have to be confident enough to be able to to be able to swim to stuff like that. Like, you know. yeah. So another one was um, a test talk. Again, another thing that was kind of nerve-wracking for a lot of people. Uh, one of the tests, you have to give a test talk. you have be given a subject. It could be, let's just say, helicopter engines. And you have to give that test talk the next day in front of a class which can be, for some people, quite nerve-wracking, you know. Again, so th- what's happening there is just they're, they're testing your ability to see if you're confident. Um, and that's, that's what they're looking for, you know, they're looking for confident people that they can trust to go on to become crewmen, so, yeah. I have noticed, like, I, just the night before we, we recorded this, I was, I was actually up in a heli 
myself as part of another kind of a gig that we were doing with the press office. And I, you do notice the sort of seamless way that the crewmen and the pilots and, and the helis talk to each other, and that everybody's very confident and sure of what they're doing. And do you know what I mean? So it doesn't. It it makes perfect sense that you would do test talk and need, test talks and need to be confident speakers. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, yeah, they're trusting you and what you say. So you need to be confident in what you're saying. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of trust there and a lot of, uh, yeah. Wow. Just confidence is a big thing that we're looking for, like, yeah. Fantastic. And so we might just talk a bit about the kind of roles that a that helicopter crewman w w would, would have. And then we might, we might kind of go into, so, so what, you, what you mentioned there previously was like the selection process for the course, the, like what you need to do to actually do the course. So we might talk then about the course itself. So first of all, like what, what are the roles of a crewman in, a, in, a, in, a heli in the Irish Air Corps? Yeah, so the roles are, there's, there's many of them. Again, we could do several podcasts <laughs> on each one. But um, the basic role, so the first thing, that your, 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 your first role is essentially um, you're, you're, you're the safety of the aircraft in the rear. You're, you're, you're managing the aircraft in the rear. Um, so basically, if the nature of our job, we're landing helicopters, it's not always airport to airport. Um, you could be going to the very tight uh, areas, very hazardous areas, confined spaces. So as a crewman, your bread and butter basically is getting that aircraft in there safely. Mm -hmm. um, so the pilots up front, they're obviously very busy flying the aircraft itself. Their field of view can be limited. So if you're going into, if you imagine a turning circle in the mid middle of a forest, my responsibility is to open up the side door and I'm going to talk, help talk the pilots in onto that, onto that target safely. So we could, I could move them in on top of it and then bring them down. So I have, I have a really good range of uh, our field of view from the from the side. I can see all the way to the front side and to the rear. I can look under the aircraft, and I can see pretty you know pretty good and talk them down onto the ground safely. So that's that's the the bread and butter of being a crewman is is getting the aircraft into into tight hazardous areas. Um, so that's a very basic one, and that alone is a pretty uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know a very acquired skill. It yeah. takes a lot of training, a lot of. Uh, Errors go into that is to get to get that perfect that like, and at the end of the day, it's very very serious job. Like you know, it's not something you can you can uh, you know not do a hundred percent. Yeah, of know. course. Yeah, there's such a safety element involved. Like yeah, that's it. So a lot of time goes into that until you're really confident. Um, you'll have instructors there training you up the whole time. But even that, so like even before all of that, there's a lot of there's, there's things like aviation speak, um, just those things that you're also trying to learn. Um, you're, you're trying to learn your safety equipment, how they work, firefighting. Um, just, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it and it takes a lot of time to, to build up to it. Um, but yeah, that would be the basic stuff then. Um, so once you get confident with that, with, uh, I'll let you go into the advanced roles. Yeah. So the advanced roles will be, you start off with troop transport, so moving uh, infantry soldiers to, to location for army exercises. Um, after that, you can go into fast roping with the uh, army ranger wing. Um, ab sailing as well, air gunnery, it's a, a more of a, it's a terror and counter terrorism operations and training. Um, you have your NVG then, so NVG night vision goggles training. That again, once you're once you're up to a certain level and you have a a, a certain amount of flight errors and experience, you'll go on to the night vision training. So we're able to fly at night time with night vision goggles on, which is a whole different ball game. Um, it makes it's a lot more intense, a lot more, a lot more. Uh, Dangerous, you could say as well, you know. So yeah. obviously operating in the pitch black, um, going into those those confined hazardous areas. Um, so again, you're starting from scratch there almost again and building up your errors and experience with night vision operations. Um, and that's incredible too. And, and like uh, like as I was saying, I, I was up. It was last night, so it was my first experience in a heli at night. And the equipment that you have for that is incredible in the detail, but also. It is absolutely pitch black, and you, and you as the crewman have to talk a heli down into a confined space in yeah. the in the pitch black. Yeah, yeah. So we we were doing training flights. It'd be up the Wicklow Mountains, and if you have no moonlight, no starlight, cloud cover, it is as you said, pitch black. And if you lift up the goggles, you'll see nothing. You you barely see your hand in front of your face. And then using the goggles back down, it'll open it up, and it looks like daytime through the goggles. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great bit of kit, and allows us to. Um, to do things, a lot more things, you know. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so some of the other roles, um, cargo operations as well, so we're able to pick up um, materials with the aircraft and put them into other material, or other other areas. Um, so like over the years, we've had some uh, severe flooding. We were, you, were we, uh, being used for a good bit of that, delivering um, fodder to 
to or to cattle and stuff like that, or moving materials during that. Um, over the, the the bad snows we had as well, where we used a good bit of that, uh, or, or for a good bit of that. Um, what else? Another advanced skill is the firefighting. So we yeah. have um, the Bambi bucket. A lot of people might have seen pictures of that on the uh, on the Defence Forces um, websites. So the Bambi bucket is for fighting fires, for gorse fires, um, which is becoming very very common. It's quite, quite common in the summer now at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, it's always a big. It's always on RT or something afterwards. Yeah, yeah. with the with the yeah, whenever we get like a heat wave or whatever, there's always going to be gorse fires. You could see in, in um, Killarney National Parks there recently. Yeah, we had aircraft down there fighting that. So. Yeah, so essentially how that works is um, we'll attach the Bambi bucket to the aircraft. We'll find the nearest water source. And then as a crewman, so again, the crewman's role will be to, to bring the aircraft in over the water, fill up the bucket safely, and then go over to the fire and release the bucket onto the onto the fire. So as a crewman, you actually you actually pull, press a button or pull a... No, no, no. So <laughs> we're, just, we're just chatting to the pilot, um, telling him when to release it, so... They have the button up front on their control stick. Yeah. They release it. So, but we'll count them down because again, we've the better field of view, and um, from the side door. So we'll literally count down three, two, one, and they'll drop the water away. Mm. But it, it, it's it's there is a skill in it as well. So, you know, you've got your gorse fire. You need to have the aircraft at a certain speed to spread the water out, a certain height. Do you know if you want it um, to spray out more, yeah. you go up higher, and then you have to take into consideration the wind as well, like. The, the wind's going to catch some of that water and move it. But you don't want it to blow, to blow the water straight off to, no, off to the other exactly, way, away from the so, fire. So there's a good bit of skill involved in it. And yeah, each bucket is approximately 300 or 1,300 litres of water. So it's pretty effective. So, okay, so you, you've been, you've passed the selection into the crewman's course um, and, and you're, you're actually onto the course and learning how to be a crewman. Wait, how does your career develop from there or, or what kind of run does it take? Yeah, so once you pass, um, you're, you're straight in into, again, learning the aviation speak um, learning about the aircraft itself, all the spec, um, all your safety equipment and the roles that you're going to do. So also familiar familiarization with it, with flying as well. So obviously from the, the sky, everything is quite different looking. So you yeah. get familiar with that. And um, just even the noise, everything like that. So you're going with familiarization flights and orientation flights. Um, after that then, this is all airfield stuff. So yeah. nice wide open areas on the airfield. Um, you'll have an instructor with you at all times and starting off um, is basically getting you to land the aircraft in a nice wide open area and how we do that is uh, we use a thing called patter aircraft patter essentially that is again just just, just chatter for or, or talk for me to talk the pilot down on onto a, onto a target and um, so how that works is again opening the side door um, I will be looking out and I have my target or LZ my landing zone that I pick out and I want to get the aircraft there so an example would be when I open the door, I will tell the pilot that we're clear to the starboard and to the rear. So we're clear to the right and to the rear. There's no obstacles that are going to affect us or the safety of the aircraft. Yeah. After that, then I will move him on straight onto the target. So it could be forward, 60 descending. So that means we're going to move forward and then unit 60 descending. The aircraft is descending as well. Yeah. After that, it'd be forward, 40 descending. And I basically all the way down to zero and it should be on right on the target then. I can correct him then. I could bring him back two, back one, left one. Um, stuff like that so that's all very basic stuff in nice wide open areas and that all builds up then so we then go into semi-confined areas so landing an aircraft beside a building say or a hill um, and again that's that's where it gets more technical and a bit tougher moving on then into confined areas so that's we will practice that a lot and get into a confined area so again if you picture again picture a forest and a, a turning circle or like a fire break in a forest maybe yeah to land an aircraft in there Obviously, the, the blades, the helicopter blades are pretty wide. Um, a lot of moving parts, and the aircraft couldn't move around. That's where you you really come into into or into its own there, is um, getting the aircraft in there safely. And that's so we use the patter um, to get us in there safely, making sure that the helicopter doesn't hit anything, yeah. that there's no debris flying around, that it is safe, that we can even fit in there in the first place as well. Um, so, again, there's errors and errors of that um, with, with an instructor at all times. And once you get familiar and comfortable there, um, you'll then be tested on it um, in different areas, different locations, different kind of landings. So as well, you could have sloped areas. That's going to be a big one. It's You could have to land the aircraft on a sloped hill in a confined spot, um, which could be very, very tough to do, you know. Yeah, it's very technical, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so once once you get tested on that, um, and if you pass, then then you're a qualified crewman. 
And that then is even then that's only the start of the other roles and responsibilities. Yeah, it's very yeah, it's very just the very beginning. You're you're kind of a basic crewman at that point. Yeah, very basic. Yeah. And so where where kind of does it go from there? Yeah. So if you pass there, if you pass that, um, then you're on your own. So you're on your own in the rear. So there's no more instructor looking over you anymore. Um, so again, big responsibility. Um, and yeah, so I remember one of my first jobs was actually with Tara Mines. So the mines up in, 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 in Tara, we were doing a training exercise um, to bring um, the miners, they have a medical team up there. Yeah. We have a, we have a helipad up there as well um, in, in Tara Mines. So again, getting familiar with us, if anything does ever happen or for any operations, we, that was one of my first operations is to go in there and simulate um, a training exercise with the, the Tara miners. Um, and yeah, yeah. So that was, you go on there, you can do troop transport with the army. Um, so you could have up to 12 soldiers in the back of the aircraft. So again, my responsibility is looking after them. If we have weapons, making sure everything's safe, all the kit is safe. Be like, um, um, be like us army lads now to be doing something foolish, like not putting <laughs> on our seatbelt or something. So yeah. yeah, you need somebody kind of confident yeah. there. To That's it. So we're just keeping an eye on that, making sure the cabin is secure. Um, after that, then you go into the more advanced roles again: cargo, singing, firefighting, uh, Bambi bucket and stuff, um, parachuting as well. So again, all cabin management in the rear, um, and just making sure everything is running smoothly in the back. Um, so, it, but again, that could take that could take the guts of a year to get proficient in that, yeah, and build up your hours and these skills. Um, so there's a lot of lectures in them as well, and a lot of tests. Each one you get tested on as well. So. So you're building up your your, your errors and your your skill set. Um, one of the tougher ones then is the MVG. So um, once you're yeah once you're confident and proficient in doing this and during the day, you'll move on to your your MVG goggle training. So essentially operating at night time under night vision goggles, and that's a completely different ball game. It changes everything. Obviously, you know it's it's pitch black. Everything um, be a lot tougher. Everything we move to everything a lot slower. But um, yeah, that's once you get, um, once you've done that, then um, you can do all those disciplines at night time. So cargo singing at night time is 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 is, is pretty tough as well. Like you know, yeah. parachuting at night time and stuff like that. Operating with the ranger ring at night time. So then also, um, when you're building up your errors, at we'll do a, a military first responder course. Um, so basically, we'll be trained up in basics of medicine. Um, and we can do inter-hospital transfers. So we have one aircraft um, um, for inter-hospital transfers. So essentially what that is, is we can move a patient from one hospital to another. Yeah. Um, so for example, one of my, my first inter-hospital transfer, I think was probably, it would have been 2015 maybe, from, um, I think it was a newborn baby in Sligo, in the, in the hospital in Sligo, that needed a, a specialty care in Dublin. Yeah. So we flew up with our special special incubator in the back of the aircraft um, and a doctor and a nurse up to Sligo. We collected the baby and brought the baby back down to Dublin. Um, I suppose a point a point to make here on that is that, is that the, these, the aircraft, like they're all quite modular. So all these equipment is swapped in and swapped out very quickly. Yeah, 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 very quickly. And that's the great thing about the aircraft, about the, uh, the Augusta Western 139. I remember one week, um, uh, even less than a week, maybe four days, we were fast roping, firefighting, and did an inter-hospital transfer within the space of a few days. Like yeah, the yeah. same aircraft can just be chopped and changed like that. It's it's pretty brilliant. Like it's, it's really versatile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have the inter-hospital transfer, and you're doing that, and then kind of where do you sort of where do you move then? I know that that there's further kind of roles you go on to after that. Yeah. So you'll do. There's lots of inter-hospital transfers. Again, it, neonatal, so babies, infants, and adults, and um, bringing up specialist care from from um, the regional hospitals into Dublin. Um, so once you get confident there, again, you're, you're constantly building up your hours as yeah. this goes on. So this could be two or three years, you know, you're building up your flight hours, your experience. Um, you then go on to your emergency medical technicians course. So I became a medic, so I did mine in the CMU in, in the army. Um, I think it was the central sponsor. medical unit, just for, for, our, for yeah. our people at home. <laughs> yeah. The central medical unit. Um, and that was approximately... I think uh, a month of lectures and then you have a series of uh, tests and, and stuff to go through. So that took, it took a while and um, it's pretty tough. Um, there's a good bit in it. If you're going from you know zero to EMT, there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of uh, stuff there to learn. Um, so if you're successful in passing the EMT then, um, you will then be brought on to EAS, so the Emergency Air Medical Service. So you have to be um, a trained EMT 
as a crewman to go onto that onto that service. Yeah, and that's the that's so that's the service for actually going to the scenes of accidents and, and that kind of. Yeah, so unlike the inter hospital one, which is um, again twenty four seven three six five, this one is the emergency one. So the inter hospital one there's a bit more planning in it, a bit bit slightly bit more notice, you know. Whereas the EAS one, the emergency air medical service uh, helicopter, it's uh, another one three nine based down in Athlone in Custrian Barracks. Um, that's been operating there since twenty twelve. Yeah. Um, and so the difference with that is, again, it's in the name emergency. So it's it's the, the likes of uh, your your car crashes and heart attacks and stuff like. So it's just like the road ambulances you see, um, going around. It's like that, but it's a helicopter in the sky. Um, so yeah, once you're qualified as a medic, you go down there. You do four day shifts down there, um, and so the way that works is. Um, for example, car crashes. If there's a car crash in the country, and the call comes through into the NIOC, which is the National Emergency Operations Center in Tala, we have our um, air medical desk there, and uh, they will notify the helicopter that there's a call for them, um, and we'll be launched to that and tasked to that, and we'll go out to that. <clears throat> and like, what's the primary advantage of having a heli to actually to actually do these, um, say versus say a road ambulance? Yeah. So th there's many advantages. But the big one is, is 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 speed. It's obviously a lot quicker. It's cruising speed is approximately three hundred kilometers an hour. Wow. Um, and obviously there's no there's no traffic lights. There's yeah. no windy country roads up there, so we can literally go straight to the hospital or straight to the scene. As a crow flies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, if if an example is if a call comes in, um, and it meets the requirements for a helicopter, so we'll only go to very serious calls, very uh, critical calls. Um, if a call comes in, that is. And it does um, tick boxes basically that requires the heli. Um, as if, so in the in the New York Center, on the air medical desk, if a call comes in, um, and it's it's a serious critical call, we will be tasked straight away. So the way it works is we'll have the helicopter on the square in uh, Custom Barracks. It's primed, ready to go. The technicians down there. So we have a crew, we have the two pilots, myself and another um, medic, an advanced paramedic from the HSC, National Ambulance Service with us. And we have two aircraft technicians. So the aircraft technicians, they'll have the aircraft ready, serviced, ready to go, fueled up um, on the square. So a call comes in, we'll be air more airborne within a few minutes. Yeah. So just to break that down a little bit more, so if a call comes in, our phone rings, the, uh, the main pilot, the commander, he will go out and start up the aircraft. The other pilot will start getting the details of where the, the, the call is. Let's say, for example, a car crash. He will then get, so he'll get the, um, the location of that and he will start basically checking out where we could potentially land. Um, he'll pick out a number of spots um, that we could potentially land at. While, that, while he's doing that and the other uh, pilot is starting up the aircraft, myself and the advanced paramedic will be looking at the clinical details of the call, trying to get as much as we can. Yeah. Sometimes you might not get much because obviously it just happened. Um, we'll also start doing some follow-up navigation um, and getting ready to go. So within a few minutes, if we accept the call, and we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll be air more airborne within a few minutes, heading straight to that call. Well, and, and from your own role, you're, you're obviously in the role of, a, of the crewman, of, of actually being in the back of the heli and talking heli down and that kind of thing, but you also have then a medical role where you're assisting the paramedic. Yeah, so primarily our role is aircraft safety, getting us there. So once we get there safely, that is when my role changes into being a, an EMT. So if we've landed an aircraft at, say, that, that, that car crash, um, I can then assist the advanced paramedic in medical treatment of the patient. Um, so again, we could be first on scene or we could have been requested by an ambulance. So if we get there, yeah, we could have multiple patients as well. Um, I remember once we went to a, an overturned school bus. I think there was about 50 people on the bus. So yeah, it can be yeah. quite busy. So yeah, I can switch from crewman to an EMT and assist in the advanced paramedic in that. Um, so yeah, using my medical skills there, we will get the, get a patient, get them packaged, treat them as best as we can and get them um, onto the helicopter and then we can give them the, bring them straight to hospital, as I said, at a pretty good speed. Yeah. Um, straight into hospital to receive to receive care, the attention they need. And so you must have, like, regard, you've, you talk about an overturned school bus, but you must, like, as it was phrased to me, that every day for, for the AS is, is a light, it's a light changing event for the person you're picking up. So, so again, you must have seen some fairly extreme cases. Yeah, yeah. So, again, I've, I've done it years now. And, yeah, as you said, every, every, every call that we go to, it's going to be a serious one. 
Um, so again, it becomes the norm for us to be going to these things. But the kind of guys we're going to, it's 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 yeah, very serious stuff. It could be somebody's the, the you know the potentially the worst day of their life or very very dark days. Um, so yeah, and you could have that up to three or four times, sometimes five calls a day, and each one could be very very serious, very critical. So yeah. And how do you find that just just yourself? Like how do you find dealing with that? Like I mean, that must be a very high stress for for the crew as well. Absolutely, yeah. Like there's no denying that it is. It's some some pretty traumatizing things they're going to come across. At the beginning, it was quite an eye opener, but ultimately, what it comes down to is it's rewarding, you know. So it is obviously, as I said, it's, it's it could be somebody pretty pretty nasty nasty calls and um, very very dark times for them. It, it could be the, you know the worst few hours of their life essentially. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times there's a good outcome. Then the heli provides that good outcome by bringing that speed and advanced level of care we have. So that's why it's worth it. So it is it is tough, but it's rewarding. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the calls um, do have a good, a, a su- a successful outcome. Yeah, that must, obviously then you feel like you're making a real difference, which you are, like, you know, in such in such a such a critical service. Like. Yeah, and that's it. And that's that's what helps. That's what's, what's really motivating. Um, I remember only recently we went to a call. Um, it was a young child, um, essentially in cardiac arrest. Um, and... Things didn't look good. Um, we were given a medical care, but it wasn't looking great. The outcome wasn't looking great at all. Um, but I got told a week later that that kid was up high fiving the nurses in the hospital. So things like that make it worthwhile. So you know, it's it's pretty rewarding. It's amazing. Yeah. So when we talked about speed, we kind of like as in the primary advantage of the aircraft is speed. Like, can you kind of give us a, an idea of what we're talking about? I say that three three hundred miles an hour, but like, is there a time difference, like or? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the big thing that the aircraft brings to these to these calls is speed. So again, once a call comes in, we could be airborne within a few minutes, and we're straight away doing approximately three hundred kilometers an hour to that call. And as I said earlier, there's no lights, there's no traffic lights, there's no windy or uh, windy roads in the way. We go straight there. Um, sometimes you might have to navigate weather. Obviously, Ireland, everyone knows the weather isn't isn't the best at all. Yeah, a, lot yeah. of, a lot of rain and stuff like that. Like so. But the aircraft that we have is uh, it's a great bit of kit. We can actually fly with zero visi- 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 visibility. And we can fly, it's called a thing called IFR, Instrument Flight Rules. So we can actually fly into cloud, doing the same speed, but using the aircraft, again, to safely bring us to a call or to a hospital, um, which is a great bit of kit. So again, the thing is, if you live in the, in the city and you call an ambulance, you're going to be in a hospital within a few minutes. But where the heli really comes into its own is for the countryside. So I'm talking, you know, Connacht, um, way out west, and yeah. all of um, Mayo down to Galway, Clare, all these areas. Um, so, for example, a lot of our calls are heart attacks. Um, obviously, if somebody's having a heart attack, they need to be in, brought into a hospital straight away as quick as they can. Every second that goes past is essentially the, the heart muscle is, is deteriorating. So where the heli comes in there is we'll go there, we could pick up a patient, let's say, for example, out in Clifton, way out west, um, the nearest PCI lab there, the, the lab that needs to treat these these heart attacks is in Galway. So by road, that's a long spin, um, whereas the heli, obviously using the speed, um, can go straight from Clifton into Galway within a matter of minutes. Wow. And that's where it really changes things, you know. Makes a big difference. Yeah. And so like like as regards kind of other kind of calls that you might have seen while you're, while you're while you've been on duty on the ES, you have so much experience with it. Yeah, so many. So again, a lot of our calls, as I said, are heart attacks. You could have strokes as well. Again, they need to be brought straight into hospital very quickly. Um, a lot of trauma as well. So again, car crashes, farming accidents, um, stuff like that. Like you know, um, the other great thing about it is is, for example, um, burns. We've gone through a good few calls where people have burns. We can bring them straight to the specialist care, so we could actually bypass potentially. Um, a hospital and go straight to a burns unit or plastics yeah. where they're going to end up to, which is pretty great. Yeah, and so I suppose so. You've you become a, a, a an EMT and you've you've worked with EAS. Where then do you go with regard to your kind of skill set as a crewman? Yeah. So after after that, um, you can also go on to become a winchman, which is um, a very specialist skill. Um, so yeah, you you just like with the GP course or the crewman's course, again you start from scratch for for the winchman's course. So at this stage, you'll need to have a lot of hours um, and a lot of experience to start this. Um, so winching essentially is being able to winch a man um, from the aircraft, 
then on the ground via cable. Um, the idea of it is to, like an EAS, where we'll normally land at the side of a road or a, a, a back garden or in the countryside and stuff like that. The, 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 where the winch capability comes in is if you can't land the aircraft down there, let's say a mountain or a cliff, yeah. the winch man can come down and get a patient. So, yeah, the winch man's course, very tough, um, very, very tough physically and mentally. There's a lot going on, huge responsibility. Um, so, yeah, again, starting off just like with the helicopter, you crawl, walk, run. So you start off lifting a patient um, or just putting yourself down onto, a, onto an area, then lifting a patient, then maybe using a stretcher and bringing in more things. Yeah. And then, again, once you get comfortable with that, you could bring in the, the NVG, the night vision goggles. So all of those skills then at night time, again, completely different ball game. Very, very tough, uh, very demanding. Um, so, yeah. So winching at night must be, like, par partly terrifying as well, I would think. Yeah, it's one of those things, <laughs> partly terrifying, but really rewarding, really exciting, uh, really enjoyable stuff, like. Yeah, and a really amazing technical skill, like, you know. It's yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty uh, specialist skill, all right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's great, though, I love it, like, it's, yeah. Well, thanks very much for that, Tyg. There was a real fascinating insight there into the role of a, of a helicopter crewman, and I think I think uh, aspects of it that an awful lot of people out there won't have won't have heard of before. So, listen, thanks very much for coming on. It was really excellent talking to you. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks very much. It's good, it's good to, to highlight and show, um, yeah, how much work goes into it all, like from the pilots, the rear crew, the ambulance service, the NEOC, the technicians, um, to, to, to just to show the amount of work that goes into those things. Yeah, wonderful. It's a, it's a real team effort. Definitely. Yeah. Um, for further information on the Irish Defence Forces, check out our social media channels and military.ie. Serving members are also encouraged to check out the members area of military.ie. The Irish Defence Forces podcast is available on Spotify, Acast, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode was produced by Corporal Keith Harrison of the Defence Forces Audiovisual School. The Irish Defence Forces podcast will be back soon with further episodes. Until then, thanks for listening and stay safe.